everyone. Welcome to Global Dialogue. I'm Shireen Bhan and today we're joined by the Global CEO of Adobe here at their headquarters in India. Joining me today is Shantanu Narayan. Shantanu, thanks so much for joining us and it's great to have you back here on CNBC TV 18 and in person. It's always a pleasure to be on your show, Shireen. Thanks for having me. Uh, you know, Shantanu, let me start by asking you about your view of the world. It is an increasingly uncertain time, not just because of the geopolitical tensions that we're seeing, but inflation, the central bank action, uh, and several pressure points that CEOs have their eye on. As you look at the world today, what are you most concerned about? What are you most confident about? Well, I think first in my role, if I'm not optimistic, uh, you know, I'm in the wrong role. So overall, I just continue to be optimistic about what's happening. I think the world has gone through these phases. The first unprecedented phase of what happened with the pandemic was certainly, you know, where people said, let's make sure we focus on health and safety of people. I think the war in Ukraine uh, has certainly, you know, been another one of these geopolitical shocks. Uh, but I think as it relates to Adobe, the irony is, uh, you know, whether you're not able to be somewhere in person, uh, digital has become a more important part of everybody's strategy. So, you know, I mean, I think in the long run, the consumer sentiment still seems to be fairly positive. Uh, and businesses, I think, are thinking about how they use digital to navigate whatever uncertain times they might have. You know, speaking about the uncertain times that we live in, but the acceleration of digital, and this is an interesting number that I picked up from your earnings call for the last quarter, where you talk about the fact that uh, consumers have spent a billion dollars more online in May of this year compared to April, and year-to-date shoppers have spent over $377 billion online. That's a 9% growth year on year. So you believe that despite the uncertainties, despite the inflationary pressures, this is likely to continue this trend line? There's no question. The genie is not going back in the bottle in terms of how people engage with customers. And what you're referring to, Shireen, is the third business that we have, which is the digital experience business or the experience cloud. And we have this unprecedented view of what people are doing digitally uh, because our business strategy there is enabling businesses to power their businesses digitally. And so the Adobe Digital Index Report is an ability for us to aggregate what's happening and you know I think people were always looking at is the growth accelerating yeah uh, but the reality is that more and more of this stuff is happening online what they were buying changed and you know we have really good insight into what's happening with inflation and certainly I think people moved a little bit more towards groceries as well as yeah. more you know things that they needed for their uh, running of their houses uh, but I think the trend towards online is just uh, it's it's explosive and it's not going to change. You know, when you talk to CEOs today, Shantanu, uh, what are they telling you? Yes, we continue to be believers in the digital story, but is there some degree of tentativeness that is creeping into conversations at this point in time in the boardroom, given the, the vagaries that CEOs have to deal with? I think most CEOs around the world are dealing with three issues. I think the first issue that they're all dealing with, and you touched on this, Shireen, was what's happening macroeconomic, what's going to happen with inflation, uh, what's going to happen as it relates to the war situation. So that's on people's mind. I think the second situation that everybody's also talking about is the whole hybrid work versus the back to work and, you know, uh, the war for talent and how are you making sure uh, that you recruit, retain uh, the best talent. So I think that's on everybody's mind. And then the third part is really more, I think, particular to their business, mm. which is given these two macroeconomic trends, what represents a headwind and what represents a tailwind as it relates to their business. And are they disrupting themselves? Are they being disrupted? And are they innovating? But the theme that I hear over and over and over again is if you can't control the macroeconomic situation, mm. are you running the company for the long run? And are you making the important decisions that you need to make right now to position yourself uh, for when whatever happens with the macroeconomic climate becomes more of a tailwind than a headwind? And that's, I think, the conversation that I love to have because you can't control the short run, yeah. but you can control the trajectory of the business in the long run. You know, I'll, I'll come to the levers that you're trying to control as far as your business is concerned in just a second. But since we're here at your headquarters in India, uh, let me talk to you about the India story, the kind of tailwinds that you see for your business particularly and for India in general. 
Well, first, uh, you know, let's start with uh, the fact that we celebrate 25 years of Adobe India. I know the country is celebrating 75, 75. years, uh, but we're celebrating 25 years, and it's this unbelievable milestone. I know uh, you remember when Naresh started this and we had three people, and to think about the fact that we have 7,000 people, which is, you know, a quarter of our uh, population worldwide, employee base, innovating in every aspect of our business, it just, you know, is uh, being beyond my wildest expectations in terms of how successful uh, the India R&D Center, the India Consulting Services, and now the India Market Opportunity has been for India. I think as it relates to the India Market Opportunity, uh, both digital as well as electronic payments, mm -hmm. there's some of these, uh, you know, secular trends that are actually more accelerated in India than in anywhere else in the world. The cost of transaction is plummeting in terms of financial services. The mobile uh, you know, revolution has exploded beyond anybody's means. And I think everything happening electronically and digitally with everything that's happening on payments is just a unique opportunity in India. And I think what's really substantially different even now than three or five years ago is that everybody's aspirations are not just about capturing the Indian market, for Indian companies, yeah. it's capturing the global market. And so from that point of view, the interest in all of our solutions is actually exploding. I just spoke to a couple of CEOs on my trip, and, and you know, they're so bullish about India because the demographics, as well as the population, is only going to be a positive. You know, I remember you said that uh, you're disproportionately invested in India, and of course you've always been a long-time believer in the India story, but given the, the confidence that you see in the domestic market as well as the R&D base that you've been able to set up here in India, what is it going to mean both in terms of hiring, in terms of future investments? From a build, buy, uh, or partner point of view, where does India stack up? Well, first from the build, uh, you know, we're a growth-oriented company. Uh, you know, we have been uh, achieving record revenues every year. And when we talk to the street about, you know, the fact that we have a $100 billion plus addressable market opportunity, uh, you know, growth is happening in terms of our employee base. We're one of the few companies that is still, you know, growing quite extensively. And that growth is disproportionately happening in India. We're a smaller company in terms of just the number of employees, but that doesn't change the skill set or the importance importance of talent in India, and India will just continue to be a huge place. We just finished a new building in Bangalore, we're building in, in Noida, so I, I think that just reflects our excitement on the you know, uh, employee and the skill and talent base here in India. I think as it relates to the business opportunity, that is a little bit more nascent, mm. uh, and you have to look at it by all three uh, businesses that we're in. One of the areas I'm most excited about, honestly, is what we call our creative business. And we're trying to unleash creativity for all. And when you think about what's happening in terms of the amount of content that's being created in India, the importance of education, the importance of digital literacy and you know, creative content, that's an area where the explosion of the number of people, we have this product called uh, Adobe Express, I want a billion people in India using that product to you know, communicate the idea that they have because everybody has a story to tell. So I think you have to look at each of your businesses. You have to recognize where you are on the S-curve. Some of them are perhaps you know, smaller than our global businesses. But the trajectory and the second derivative is what excites me. You know, uh, and I want to link uh, what you're seeing happen in India as far as the creative or the creator economy is concerned to the trends that you're picking up globally as well. I mean, this has seen explosive growth, especially in the last few years. But now with Web3 and the metaverse, how do you see this panning out? Well, uh, two uh, really exciting things on that. First is the creator economy. Uh, the reality is that what has happened on the web is anybody with a creative idea and if you're a small and medium business or if you're somebody who has something you want to merchandise, your ability to get a global population uh, and to differentiate yourself through our creative tools, it's never been easier to do it. And so I think we're very excited about the creator economy. We're partnering with some companies on them ability to create NFTs so that, you know, we have the ability to have electronic provenance of the goods that are being Are done. you a believer in NFTs and crypto? Well, I'm a believer in, in the technology. I'm a believer in the technology, and I'm a believer that just as physical art has a value, electronic art will have a value. Now, whether it's worth what tulips were worth in Netherlands in the early days, or whether it was worth something less, that will play itself out. 
but there's nothing inherent about electronic art not being valuable and if uh, for somebody who wants to buy it and somebody who wants to sell it there is a transaction to be made I think there was a little bit more hype associated yeah. with it uh, but it'll come back to you know a, a more normal situation the metaverse on the other hand is actually very interesting and it's interesting for the simple reason that the way I like to describe it is more and more things that you did in the physical world you're going to do in the virtual world whether it's experiencing travel whether it's experiencing medical care whether it's you know transacting business whether it's doing online commerce now that's being labeled the metaverse mm. and so the content creation and the interactivity that you have to do on the metaverse is an order of magnitude more difficult because you now have to not only create the ability to have this immersive experience but you have to have the ability to interact mm with, as they say, uh, brought the avatars or the avatars or whatever. And so Adobe has this unique role to play mm. where we're telling all of these brands, this is how you start to dip your toe in the water. This is how you create a brand. And what's happening, unfortunately, right now in the metaverse is you have multiple worlds. And so, you know, these brands have to decide which world am I betting on. Mm. But I think the whole content creation process is something that we can help them with. We have a white paper, and you are seeing more and more companies, whether it's with Meta and creating it for them, or Roblox, or other gaming environment, you have to start to experience that because that's where the next generation is. Mm. If social media is where the previous generation was starting to engage in terms of being on the internet, the metaverse will be uh, you know, one of the places where you're going to be able to attract so new what customers. So what is the playbook then for the metaverse? You said you've got a white paper out. You're working with companies like Meta, collaborating and partnering with them. What have been the learnings so far? I mean, this is just about starting to sort of take off. What are the learnings so far? I think the first learning is you have to create a presence. Much like you created a presence in social media, you have to create a presence and you have to represent what your brand is in the authentic way that's available on the metaverse. And I think that's stable stakes. The second part of it is what part of commerce do you want to create on the metaverse? And is that commerce experience more immersive, more exciting than what it would be either in a two-dimensional internet world or in a physical world? And so I think for some of the companies, their ability to show objects in three dimensions, their ability to show color with more fidelity, their ability for you to engage with somebody to show you how that actually works, the a three dimensional world really enables you to do more of that. And so I think people just being thoughtful about how you start engaging with customers and then how do you want to attract and which segment of customers do you want to attract because there's a very different segment of customers. So I think even the discipline in a company mm. of saying who is going to be watching Shireen on the metaverse and how do I think about them and what's the right content for them, I think that exercise is where the real value is. I have to start by, by having a presence in the metaverse. I, I don't even have an avatar, so I need to get started on that. But you know what I want we to We can certainly help you with that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Much needed. But what I want to ask you about, and you know, you brought up the issue of the war of talent and that being a priority that CEOs are focusing on. You know, through the course of the pandemic, uh, people said, okay, you know, work from office is over, work from home is going to be the new normal. Now everyone's talking about flexi work and hybrid workforce. Uh, you're now, you know, from the great resignation, you're coming back to now a situation where people are boomeranging, coming back to jobs that they had just quit. So how are you navigating this war for talent today? I think we did a really outstanding job, firstly. And, you know, Gloria Chen, who is our CHRO, uh, we were very clear up front where the first priority was employees' well-being and health. And the resiliency that they showed us by overnight working from home and making sure that we continue to innovate and serve our customers really fills you with a lot of pride. I also have a strong belief that, you know, in a company, you have to build culture. Mm. And you have to enable people to grow their career. People come to companies because they feel like they can have an impact and they can grow their career. And I still haven't figured out how you do that completely virtually. So we have a strong point of view, and our point of view is that We've always been a company that's flexible. Nobody has to come clock yeah. in at yeah. Adobe. But for meetings that matter, you know, I'm going to do an all hands here. Uh, I did an all hands in Bangalore yesterday. Mm. When you're incubating new projects and you want to have those, you know, creative sessions, it's only best done in person. And so I think, and, and frankly, the fatigue 
that people had when they worked exclusively at home because yeah. they weren't able to have that distinction between yeah, no when they were work exactly. exactly no separation and so we've said you know we want people to come back but we want people to come back for meetings that matter we want people to come back so that they can truly appreciate the unique culture that adobe is and we want people to come back because we can help grow their careers mm. because if i don't know somebody it's unlikely that i'm going to think about them when i have this really interesting project that i want to work on and for all those reasons uh, you know i think most employees want you to have a point of view and then they can self select whether it works for them or it doesn't work for them and i think trying to appease everybody as opposed to having a strong point of view i think the latter is a more successful way to build a culture but do you think that we're arriving at some point of stability in the talent market i mean we saw salaries which were going through the roof you saw attrition which was very high company across company are you starting to see some signs of stability return i think we've actually been fortunate in that we've seen relative stability right through it and i think you know you have to know what you stand for we always talk to employees about this is our mission we want to change the world through digital experiences we talk to employees about our purpose what we are doing in terms of creativity for all or technology to transform or adobe for all and then we tell people it's it's your job to self select in terms of what happens i think the companies that chase uh trying to be a company that they're not mm. they are the ones that are, you know suffer this whiplash and for us i think one of the most successful ways to hire has been our college hiring program it's a try before you buy right i mean you get a whole bunch of interns they see whether they feel like adobe is a company where they can do their best work and we look at them and say you know how can you contribute and so i think as long as you have those sustainable programs yeah. and you don't have whiplash uh, those are the companies that are going to win in the long run you know speaking about winning in the long run and i know that uh, there is a lot of emphasis on organic growth but there's also been emphasis on inorganic growth and you've sort of picked uh, companies that uh, fit in to your portfolio and uh, look after certain gaps that you believe uh, you needed to plug as you look at that space today and uh, you know valuation is a different story altogether valuations go up and down but that's not going to be the reason why you acquire something what would be the driving rationale behind m&a today for you well first i think you know uh, even as i have evolved in my role just accepting that great ideas come from everywhere and accepting that inorganic acquisitions in addition to organic innovation is a good way to grow a company that's step 1 which is to say hey if there's a great idea and somebody has built great technology and they have a market why not use your capital to good use as long as your shareholders also benefit so we look at technology we look at culture and we look at the people and for us uh, you know our business model is all about growth and so we're really looking to understand are these people for whom the growth agenda for them would be better done within adobe as opposed to a stand alone company we're not other companies go and they cut costs and you know that's yeah. their business model that's not our business model so we're really thinking about a growth oriented agenda i think what you are going to see and you touched on valuations there were unrealistic valuations and what happened over the last 5 years was you had all these single product companies that are not platforms and a number of them are going to fall by the wayside you know they're not going to be sustainable businesses and i think that represents an opportunity for large established companies to look at it now what has to happen is perhaps in some cases a certain amount of time to elapse yeah. because people still have that you know uh, peak valuation huh. in their mind but i think you will see the mna activity heat up and i think you know when we look at our businesses as long as they meet the technology and the people criteria you know we'll do it but adobe has been perhaps a little bit more conservative than most companies because we want the culture and the onboarding to go right and most of all we want just really cool technology and great people so speaking of cool technology you know what what should we expect you've got the big max conference coming up in october uh, you know give us a sneak peek of uh, the cool stuff that you're working on how much time do you have <laughs> <laughs> a couple of things that I'll mention I I think everybody's talked about the profound impact of AI and ML and I think our ability to anticipate what customers want to do and use technology so that they can focus on the output rather than the task at hand I think that's one area where we're constantly pushing the envelope and I think you'll see in all of our creative tools you know people are still terrified of that blank page yeah. when you're starting a creative process so how can you describe your intent and use AI and ML in order to do that and you know we always say if there 
tens of millions of people using our products every day, and there are hundreds of millions or billions of assets being created in our product, how can we use every one of that interaction to make our products more accessible, more fun, and more productive for our new users. So at Max, you know, which is the biggest creativity conference, it tends to be a love fest because all the creative people are talking about it. I think what we are talking about with content authenticity, mm. that's where we are stepping up in our responsibility to say, hey, Adobe is not just about creating content, but it's also about, you know, what's the veracity of this content and how do you make sure, and the number of companies that have partnered with us you know, to combat fake news or whatever you might mm -hmm. refer to it. That's an exciting area that we view as our responsibility in terms of what we are doing. So, so that's interesting. What, 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 explain to me what you're doing on the content authenticity part. So, uh, you know, we look at it and say, if people are creating content in Adobe's, you remember when publishing went through yeah. this change and you had a byline. Yeah. And it said, this is content created by Shireen. Yeah. And you stood by that piece of content. Mm -hmm. So the first thing we're doing is we're saying, let's make sure that when people create content in Photoshop or Illustrator or InDesign, you have your identity and you're signing that content in terms of what you're doing. We've signed up with companies like NVIDIA and Qualcomm on the chips so that we're actually inserting then, you know, pieces of data that verify that authenticity of that content. We've then partnered, whether it's with New York Times or Microsoft or Twitter, to say as you then publish that content, let's make sure that you have a user experience by which you specify, hey, this content was published by Shireen. And so I think taking that content through the entire workflow, uh, so we've done that and most partners have immediately embraced it and they're saying we will provide the identity of the person who's done it. The third phase of that is using artificial intelligence. So when that content was changed, how can we tell the user, hey listen, even though that content was first originated in an Adobe app and authored by so and so, right. we can tell you definitively that that content has changed and that's been altered. The last step in this is actually the tricky one, which is how do you change it so that a consumer when they're going to CNBC.com and looking at that content, they've also been trained to say, I want to see you know, the entire chain right. of how that content has happened. And that's the part where education mm. is important. And so we've put all the building blocks in place and everybody has really embraced this idea of how we step up uh, in the content supply chain. I think that last step is when content viewers or the consumers say, you know what, that's important to me. Yeah. And I don't want to see a piece of content and that's going to be the last link in the chain. Well, I, you know, this is, this is certainly something that I'm thinking about and it's, it's interesting that you brought this up. But you know what I want to now understand from you, Shantanu, is where you see the next wave of disruption uh, through the pandemic, you know, e-commerce boom, ed tech, health tech. Where do you believe are the next spaces, payments, we talked about that. Where are the next spaces that you believe that we're going to see this kind of transformative disruption? I think all of those spaces are clearly spaces, you know, where, uh, you know, the pace of innovation is only accelerating. But if there are two that I'm particularly passionate about, and if I was earlier in my career, I would have probably said it. One is, I think, the confluence of what's happening in healthcare mm. and technology. I mean, first, I think it's amazing to see, you know, what the world's been able to do in terms of vaccinations. Yeah. But I think just thinking about how technology can be used to create personalized medicines for rare diseases or oncology, I think we're at the early stages of that. And you know, to, to a large extent, I think drug discovery is pattern matching. Mm. And so that's an area that I'm particularly excited about. I think education as well, and access to education, uh, that's an area that's of particular passion to me because I believe that Everybody needs access, and I think through this pandemic, the fact that people don't have to yeah. be in a physical setting. I, you know, when any university used to say, we take pride in the fact that we've only admitted 3% of people, I, I'm like, it's crazy. You should be ashamed of the fact that you're only admitting 3% when there are, you know, so many other people who are both eligible to be in an institution like yours and worthy of that. And so I think education is the area if we can democratize education again, I think both even in the India context, 
Yeah, there are just so much more opportunities. So those are two areas, in addition to everything at Adobe, uh, that I'm particularly excited about. You know, speaking of uh, opportunities, and I want to get some clarity from you on this number that you've spoken about. You said that you've never been more confident on the ability to execute on the $205 billion market opportunity ahead of you. You know, explain this $205 billion market opportunity to me. Well, we're in three businesses today, right? I mean, the traditional history of the company was creativity for all. Mm. And if you just look at the amount of content that's being created, the amount of content that's being consumed, the devices, we talked about the metaverse, AR, video has just absolutely exploded. We're in the sweet spot to enable anybody who has that story to tell, to tell that story. Accelerating document productivity. I mean, look at the number of PDFs that are being created. You know, you can now do a physical signature. It used to be governments and agencies would say, well, we don't consider a, yeah. uh, electronic signature legitimate. That's thrown out of the window. And so I think everything to do with document intelligence and automating document productivity, just an immense, immense opportunity. And the third one is this powering digital businesses. It doesn't matter whether you're a B2C company or a B2B company. It doesn't matter whether you're an Indian company or a global company. You are going to engage with your customers digitally. And you have to create this immersive, personalized experience. And we created the digital marketing category. So I think you add all three of these, and if you think about the secular tailwind for digital, that's what excites us about the opportunity. You know, now I want to talk to you about an issue that I know we've spoken about previously as well, but. Uh, the rise of Indian origin CEOs on the global map. You started the trend along with a few others. Uh, Are you saying I'm old, Shireen? <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying you're distinguished. <laughs> but, you know, how do you explain it? And, and I go back again to, to the most recent conversation that I was having with, with people that you know on this issue. Uh, and Piyush Gupta at DBS said... Uh, hat. You know, he, hat, exactly. I do listen yeah, to you. You your... do you listen to me, I'm impressed. Uh, uh, but how, how do you explain it as you see it today from from the time that you uh, made it big to what you see happen today I think in that seg segment that you had I mean people talked about a lot of the advantages that we have access to an excellent education system the ability to speak English maybe the immigrant hunger mentality mm -hmm. that I think you know was also talked about I think also right now hopefully there are more role models right and if they're role models and people look at it and say, well, if he can do it, I can certainly do it. Uh, and I think, you know, there's more acceptance in the United States that, you know, Indians have. And maybe one of the things that we have in particular is this uh, mix of both technology mm. as well as managerial skills. Mm. And we were technologists at heart. But it is so gratifying. And whenever there's a new uh, one who comes, I, I met with Lena in London recently, yeah. and I told her, you know, how thrilled we were to have, you know, somebody uh, like her leading one of the biggest fashion brands. And, you know, and we were all offered to be a, a self-help group, you know, if there's any way in which we can help. But it's every time one of those comes, you know, your, your heart is filled with a little bit of pride. Is there a self-help group? Are you, is there a group that mentors potential CEOs? I think mentors would probably be an exaggeration, but I would say we're there. We're always there to offer advice and offer help and, you know, be a sounding board. Mm. I prefer the word sounding board because, you know, all of us in our jobs have to do what we think is right. Yeah. But we can be sounding boards. You know, it's interesting you brought up Lena because, you know, we've of course seen this happen through the tech world. I mean, every large tech company today has an Indian origin CEO, but we're starting to see this move outside of tech as well. Do you believe that this is the start of a new sort of wave that we're seeing, the acceptance outside of technology? I do believe that. I mean, you've certainly seen it in financial services with Venkat running Barclays. You see it at, you know, Reckitt and consumer goods companies. You see it at fashion companies. And so uh, I, I do think so. And I think, you know, it... Uh, I think it propels a lot of people to say, you know, I would like my uh, shot, uh, you know, at the big leagues. So I think it's great. What was it about the Hyderabad Public School uh, that has seen you, Ajay Banga, Satya Nadella, uh, come through and then, you know, make your way in the world? I, I, it is it is pretty crazy. But, you know, I, I, I think the all-round education uh, that we all had, and, and as you know, Prem Watsa's father yeah. was actually our principal. Yeah. And so, you know, uh, I don't know. I, I, it was magical. It was you, a magical time. Do you talk time. about this? Have you, you know, I'm sure you, you, have you discussed what it could have been about that environment? 
Well, I think, you know, there were two things for me in particular that stood out. The first was, uh, it wasn't just about academics. It was so much about academics and extracurricular activities. You know, I was the editor of the school magazine. I was the captain of the debate team. You had to play sports every uh, evening, in which case you learned about team. And, and I think the second part was leadership. You know, we had the prefect system and stuff like that. So I think, you know, they were at the end of the day just trying to provide you with all of the uh, tools that you needed. Uh, you know, but I, it's... <laughs> I know people have said if there's a way to bottle that, right? Yes. Uh, that would be nice. But it, it was an amazing place. You know, uh, as you look back at your career, Shantanu, and if I would ask you about the assumptions that you made when you started off and where you are today, uh, how much of that has changed? How much of your own approach to management, to business, to leadership has changed? What have you learned or unlearned over the years? Well, it's a lot, Shireen. I mean, in, in all humility, you look at it every year and you say, oh, my God, I was clueless, you know, uh, when I first started this a few years ago. And hopefully, you know, I think the intellectual curiosity that you have to want to continue to grow uh, has been the thing uh, that's helped uh, in this particular case. I think for me, what stayed constant is my love for products. I love building products and I love building technology. I think we've talked about the fact that I wanted to be a journalist and you know, Adobe vicariously, I am in the publishing business and I am in the journalism business. So I think the thing that's remained really constant for me is this real affinity with the mission for the company. What's changed dramatically is the scale. You know, we were less than a billion dollars in revenue uh, when I joined. We were a billion dollars in market cap. You know, at our peak we were 300, we're now 200 billion. So I think the scale and how you manage through this extensive set of people and talent that you have, that's changed. And, you know, I, I think the other thing that's changed a lot is one of the things I like to say at the company is, are we looking around the corner enough? Are we disrupting ourselves? And I think people like to do what they're good at, but you're expected to do what I think has more impact for the company. So that's something that I try and think about. And as a management team, our entire management team every year sits down at the beginning of the year and says, what are three things that at the end of the year, if we look back, would we have moved the needle for the company? And I think that's been an exciting uh, part for me and, and growing by having you know, this talent that we have in the company. You know, you, you talked about your love and fascination for products, and I'll end with that. We're finally starting to see some of that story and narrative shape as far as India is concerned. And many people now argue that this is perhaps going to be the decade for India as a product nation. Do you believe that? I, I think India will play a role in that. I think how they play a role beyond the Indian market for the international market more than just the talent I think that's something that, you know, will require uh, a, a little bit more evolution in terms of what happens. But I think access to capital is infinite in India. Access to talent is infinite in India. And the question is, are there enough role models in the Indian context of companies that have, you know, uh, achieved tremendous success, not just in the Indian context? And I think the more you have of that, that'll pave the way for the next one. So you're much more closely aligned with, you know, what's happening on, on that startup. But I think yeah. the startup environment, uh, because what makes the Bay Area so unique, if I were to end, was to say, everybody in the Bay Area knows somebody who's been at a startup. And it makes no difference whatsoever whether the startup was successful or whether the startup failed. Yeah. But you all know somebody who was at a startup that was successful, yeah. and you want to be part of that movement. And I think if India can, you know, they've created the infrastructure, they've created the environment. Now you need those success stories where everybody's like, I want to be one of those. Yeah, we hope that we see plenty of those success stories. But Shantanu, it's always a pleasure. Thanks so much for joining us here on the Global Dialogue. Appreciate your time and we look forward to seeing you back here. Thank you for having me. Well, that's it then on this edition of the Global Dialogue. From all of us here on the team, goodbye. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again shortly. Goodbye.